Chapter 19, Part 2, where Ingenog and Engendog were making ready for the fight. Ingenog spent days hewing as heavy a club as he could swing. And though the people did not know it, Engenog hewed one too. After that, the twins went off where no one could see them, and they practiced using the clubs until both became very skillful. Time passed. Only one day was left before the fight. That night, while the rest of the islanders slept, the twins went secretly to that place where the men had piled the pentecas that were to be carried to Bunga in the morning. With great care, they opened each penteca, cleaned it out, and filled it with pebbles. Then they put the fruit back together so that not even the sharpest eye could see that a single penteca had been touched. This they did, and then they went home to sleep. In the morning, Ingenog came to lead the men up the mountain. Ingenog was not to be seen. No one knew where he was. The men who carried the pentecas complained how heavy they were. It is your own strength that's failing, said Ingenog, and the men really believed what he said. Up the mountain they went and piled their fruit in front of Bunga. When the giant felt the pentecas, he was pleased and said, Your fruit has ripened well, and he ate it all with an appetite. The time came for the fight. Ingenog stepped forward while the others stood by to see what would happen. Bunga got up but he was so full of pebbles that he moved slowly and with much trouble. The minute Ingenog advanced to attack him, Ingenog appeared from over the other side of the mountain. So much alike were the twins in every way that the two-faced giant thought he was only looking at one person. This confused him. How could the same person be in front of him and behind him at the same time? He rubbed his eyes and looked more carefully. And every time he looked, first Ingenog struck him, then Engenog struck him. Bunga turned this way and that, but always, no matter what he did, one of the twins was attacking him from behind and the other from in front. This made him mad. He strutted about furiously, striking here and there with blows that meant to kill. But he was sluggish and heavy and his aim was poor. The twins fought with all of their might. They pounded the giant on the stomach. They pounded him on the back. And their clubs struck him with dull, sickening thuds. Bunga shouted and taunted them about their weakness. He said, You are a wonderful man to be on both sides of me at the same time. But what good will it do you? I can hardly feel your blows. Hit me harder. And then he stood still, raised his arms, and let Ingenog hit him for all that he was worth. Hit me again, he shouted. I didn't feel that at all. Ingenog hit him again and again and again. Now, said the giant, hit me first on one side and then the other and he spread his legs so that Ingenog could run between them. Then Ingenog and Engenog hit him one after the other in such quick succession that their blows seemed to fall 
at the same time. Bunga smiled and said, You are doing very well. Keep it up. It helps me to digest the pentecas. But all of a sudden, the pebbles began to pain him. And a look of anguish came over his face. And he said, Enough! Stop it! And when the twins did not stop, Bunga once more began to fight. The harder he fought, the more the pebbles pained him. And he really thought Inganog was hitting him hard enough to hurt. This frightened him, for never before had such a thing happened. The pain grew worse and worse, until at last the giant doubled up and fell writhing on the ground. His club rolled out of his hand, and he groaned in agony. The next minute, the twins picked up his club and pounded poor Bunga so hard on the stomach that he cried for mercy. I'll go, I'll go, he groaned. Stop, I'll do anything you want. I will go. Ingen Nog said, Call your cloud and I'll let you go. Then Bunga called for his cloud. The cloud lowered over the peak, and when it lifted, Bunga was gone. The cloud drifted away, and the sun shone again. And once more, the people of Kar enjoyed the happiness that had always been theirs. Ingenog and Engenog were made kings, and all of the people of Kar are alive and happy to this day. For some time, after the story was finished, the king and the queen and the courtiers sat staring at Nooms or Noom. They could not take their eyes off the man who had read such a wonderful story. Yet though all seemed intent on nothing but the storyteller, at the same time, they were listening for the golden door. They were waiting for it to open, but they heard nothing, for the door did not budge. At last, the king looked at the door. When he saw that it was still tight shut, he was disappointed and angry. He said to Noom Zornum, Your story was a good one, if you had told it instead of read it. I think the door might have opened. You did not obey my orders, and now I must suffer for another year. But you will suffer too. You must pay the penalty. Your head must come off. When Noom or Noom heard what King Tazarin said, he did not know what to do. He thought to himself, This serves me right. I never should have brought Tall with me. How can I save him? He looked at Millie Tinkle, as if she could help him out. But she was standing there dumbfounded, with her eyes on the floor. For the last thing she ever expected was that the door would not open. Then the old man said to the king, I have failed, and I am willing to die. But before I am beheaded, I should like to ask one thing of you. What is it? asked the king. That you put the crystal block back on my donkey's back and let her go where she wishes, said Noom or Noom. I'll kill you both, said the king in his anger. One of you is as bad as the other. I want to die with my master, said Millie Tinkle quite forgetting about Tall. You may, said the king. Then he turned to the guards and said, take this man out and behead him. Take his donkey with him too. I wish to see nothing more of either of them. As soon as the king spoke, 
three guards rushed forward. Two of them started to carry Noom or Noom out of the room, and the other one led Millie Tinkle. They did not touch the crystal block. They left it lying on the floor in front of the throne. But before they reached the door, the king shouted in his rage, Wait! Don't take him away until he has seen his crystal block smashed to bits before his own eyes. Noom or Noom and Millie Tinkle tried to say something, but the guards would not let them speak. Then another guard was called, and he came forward with a sledgehammer to smash the crystal block. While Noom or Noom and all the others looked on in breathless silence, the guard raised his hammer and brought it down with all of his force onto the crystal block. There was a crash. All the candles went out and the room became dark. And above the murmur of many voices could be heard the king shouting, what has happened? Why did the candles go out? He had just finished these words when the golden door began to glow. As it glowed, one of the eyes in the golden head lit up so bright that it cast a beam of light across the room. Then slowly, little by little, the door swung open. And as it opened, the beam of light from the eye swept across the room until it shone on the spot where the crystal block had been smashed. There it stopped, casting its bright light on Tall, who sat among the broken bits of the crystal. For a moment, no one said a word. No one breathed. And before the king could realize what had happened, the golden head spoke and said, there is your son. He has come back to you. Then the queen shouted, It's it's our boy! And she rushed down to where Tall was sitting. The king followed behind her, forgetting his dignity and stumbling along as best he could in all of his robes. They took hold of Tall and kissed him and hugged him until he was almost smothered. And everyone else in the room crowded around as close as they could get. Meanwhile, the eye stopped shining, the door shut, and the candles began to burn again. So intent was everyone on the boy who came out of the crystal block that no one thought to look behind the golden door. When they did think of it, it was too late. And though some of them tried to make it open again, it would not move. After his first joy at seeing the boy was over, the king called to the guards and made them bring Nooms or Noom before him. He looked at the old man and asked, did you bring this boy in? I did, said Noom or Noom. Where did he come from? asked the king. I brought him with me from a place called Martuna, said Noom or Noom. And he went on and told the king all that he knew about Tall. You did well, said the king. You and your donkey are free. After that, there was a great deal of talking and a great deal of confusion. And soon the word spread throughout Trum that the king's son had come back. So Tall turned out to be King Tazarin's son. He became the prince that he really was. All the storytellers were freed from the prison. Noom or Noom was made vizier and he and Millie Tinkle were given one of the best rooms in the palace. 
King Tazarin, now that he and had his son back, became the good and kind man that he had been before the prince had disappeared. He ruled his people well and made them happy. The first night that Tal was home with his mother and father, he told them all about Martuna. And when the king and queen heard how well he had been treated in that village, they sent to Martuna and brought all the people to Trum. King Tazarin gave them houses and money and everything else to make them happy. And they lived as well as they deserved to live. Tall, Nooms or Noom, and Millie Tinkle never forgot their visit to Trum. They still talk about it and laugh about the time Tall became part giraffe. Millie Tinkle had become a little less argumentative, but not much. Today, Tall is king, and his title is King Tazarin II, the greatest king of Trum. So far, the golden door has never opened again, not even for Tall. And to this day, no one knows what is behind it. Stars and moon and sun, now our story is done. There's a couple pictures. Here's a picture of the twins pounding on the giant. And there is the picture before the king could realize what had really happened. The golden head spoke and said, there is your son. And then there's just one last little picture at the end. Hmm. A story.